So, Ani, uh, Bojo, welcome everyone. Uh, Victoria Serta here from the Bagatawad Alliance. Um, I'm really um, happy, well, privileged, honored um, to uh, be here with Lori Kawakam, um, who is going to be talking ab about a really important topic and one that I've had a lot of conversations with um, people over the years uh, in the uh, Anishinaabe communities whose lands um, they kindly shared with me. <laughs> and I try to show my appreciation by supporting uh, what they want to do and uh, in talking about important things like this. Uh, we are live streaming to Facebook and we're recording this um, and going to be putting it on YouTube. Um, and that's something Lori would like to be able to share this conversation so that um, more people are able to be able to listen and be part of this. Um, so I just wanted to let everybody know that we are, are recording and streaming. If anyone doesn't want to be on the, um, on the live stream, uh, you can uh, just don't show your video. We would only be able to hear your voice, um, but you you would still be heard <laughs> heard by your voice if you if you are sharing. Um, so for for the start of this, we're going to ask if everybody can be on mute and listen to Lori, uh, and it'll be up to Lori if and when she would like to open it up uh, to have more of a conversation. Um, but we expect everyone to be. Um, respectful and kind and gentle with each other. And um, uh, we're just really, really happy that there's so many people that, that want to be part of this conversation and be here tonight. So, so miigwech for coming. Um, so a little bit about me and Lori. <laughs> we go back a little ways. We've done a reasonable amount of work together. Um, I, I've, uh, Lori's helped me along my healing journey over the years, and um, I've tried to, uh, to be a good, in, a good ally in a good way um, with the Saugeen and Niwash communities. And so this type of um, event, um, yeah, like I'm honored and privileged to be part of it. And, and to support this. So I'm, I'm a little bit more of a tech support person um, on a lot of these as, a, as an ally to the community members. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're Natasha and I from uh, the Bagadawad end are just really happy to be supporting these um, types of important conversations. So um, we're looking forward to hearing more. So um, Bajo, Lori, uh, miigwech for coming, and uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> okay. Well, Bojo, Ani, miigwech everybody for um, coming in and, and wanting to be a part of this conversation. So just to give you some background on, on who I am, <clears throat> my spirit name is Wabganikwa, Nigik Dodem, Otter Clan, and Sagin Donjabai, I'm from Sagin First Nation. And I've been on my own personal healing journey for probably over 25 years now. And a lot of it was dealing with traumas that I've experienced uh, within my own life and, and coming to understand what those are and, and where they came from. Um, my role I have a role in the community and I am the advocacy for healing program coordinator. And this program focuses on historical trauma. So it's funny how it's kind of come full circle for me in the sense of not knowing a whole lot about things such as residential school and those kinds of things uh, when I was younger. Um, I do remember as a child, maybe about nine years old, um, my mother just mentioned kind of during a, some conversation we were having that she had gone to girls training school. And then that's all she said. I had no idea what that was, but it stuck with me. So as I got you know, older and, and uh, my husband and I you know, started to work at breaking some cycles that, that we were experiencing. Um, started to learn more about things that, that had happened to our people. 
And then in the role <clears throat> that I started with back in the community when I first came back, because I went to work off the reserve for a while. And when I came back, I came back as cultural wellness coordinator. And during that time, uh, that's where I started to understand more about what residential school was and then the Indian day schools. So thinking back as a child, when I didn't know what my mom meant when she said I went to girls training school, now I'm in a, a position with my community where I'm working to hopefully help our community to um, learn to heal from those traumas. So yeah, it's been, it's been really um, interesting and finding identity and understanding why certain things were the way they were. So when I first started to um, communicate with Victoria with regard to doing this online conversation, <clears throat> I thought it would be a good time to, you know, explore further what cultural, historical and multi-generational traumas were and how do they impact us personally. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm going to light a smudge and whether you have smudge there at home or not, just because this conversation might get a little difficult. It might um, trigger some things. So I just wanted to be sure that everybody is in a safe space and that you're okay. Um, feel free to jump in if there's something that's starting to um, affect you because we'll deal with it on the spot. There's, I, I don't want you to you know, be, be leaving this Zoom session and still dealing with stuff. We'll, we'll deal with it right away. And then before we go off, uh, we'll have a debriefing. I just wanna make sure everybody's in a good space before we, we sign off. So I'm just gonna light up my smudge. Um, that's part of the teaching we received too in regard to those times when we're talking about ancestors and, and talking about difficult times that we have our, our smudge burning because it's a medicine. So if you don't have smudge, then I send the spirit of the smudge to you as well. So it's sage that I'm using and I'm just gonna have it burning here. So I'm just gonna go through and just kind of talk about what those three types of traumas are. And we may end up discussing all kinds of different tra traumas. So, as we move along, it, I would like this to turn into more of a discussion where everybody has an opportunity to come in and share and we'll just, we'll just talk. So I'm just gonna go through and look at what they have found to be definitions. So when we look at cultural trauma, says cultural trauma occurs when members of a collectivity feel that they have been subjected to a horrendous event that leaves inedible marks on their group consciousness, marking their memories forever and changing their future identity in fundamental and irrecoverable, eh, tongue got twisted, uh, ways. Then there's the historical trauma. Uh, historical trauma is entirely different than consciously holding onto the past when it resides in your ancestral memory and DNA. It results in numerous defense mechanisms, developmental malfunctions, and behavioral issues. This is scientifically proven and is supported in studies. And when we start to look at the multi generational trauma, we look at how that has impacted whole families. So when I'm working in my role in the community, I also have a different role, which is my own personal journey, which is looking at the healing and, and how do we heal the afflictions that people are experiencing. So um, many times we're finding with the healing work, that it is generational and there it's, it's trauma-based. 
so it's just uh I, I i believe that the two work hand in hand the the role of advocacy coordinator and also the work that i do on a personal level so i i meld them and i i work together in those two roles in in working with the community so we're going to conduct this as it would be in circle i'm not sure if everybody's been in circle but what that is is we're going to go to each individual to allow that time for you to uh, um, introduce yourself and say whatever it is that you want to share and when we get back to me then we'll just we'll just go further into um just some understandings of what those three types of traumas are and like i said there's probably more types that are going to come in because we have the current um traumas as well which happens even heavier as we move through our own personal lives so let's go around the circle and have some introduction see who's all here so whoever wants to jump in first Victoria, maybe you can unmute somebody and they can come in and introduce themselves. I'll unmute Catherine to start with since she's a friend of mine and okay. I know that she won't mind. <laughs> Hi, my name is Catherine. I'm speaking to you today from Waterloo, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe and neutral people. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to learn. And I just thank you very much for allowing me to be included in your circle. Mm. Thank you much for coming. Alexa? Um, yeah, hi, my name's Alexa and I, um, I live in Owen Sound and I used to work at G&B House. And years ago, we had many young men um, from uh, both reserves um, that were there uh, because of alcohol issues. And in that role, I met some young men who told me horrific stories. Mm -hmm. And I still think about one man that I know um, that is still on reserve that is you know has lost himself because he told the truth and it was just too much for him to bear and i was so afraid for him and i still think of him often so i'm here because i i have been witness to the stories the horrendous stories of the sexual abuse that went on mm -hmm from the priest. So that's my, and of course I've had trauma personally, mm -hmm. but, but you know, nothing like we're talking about here. Thank you for, Sally, thank you for allowing me to be part of the circle. Mm. Thank you for coming in. Miigwech, um, C. Chevalier. Would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> Bonjour, everybody. Bonjour. Uh, I am a, so I'm Shante or Wabjagosi Nimkikwe. I have no idea how to spell that. Um, I am a Saugeen Off Reserve member. Oh. I'm from the Wabigona family. So my mother, if you knew her, was Paula Huxtable. So I'm a multi-generational 60s scoop. Mm -hmm. um, my mm -hmm. mom and her family, half her family was, well, her whole family was 60s scoop. Um, so all 10 siblings and herself were 60s scoop and half of those 10 were missing and murdered indigenous women, including my mom mm -hmm. uh, and my sister two Augusts ago joins the list mm. um i'm um i have a grant in with the healing foundation to try to do a 60 scoop healing project that i invented so i'm joining you today so in preparation for 
may be getting that grant and getting mm -hmm. to help in my community. I live in Niagara now. So trying to help other people like us over here. So miigwech for um, allowing me to join you all today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Miigwech. Um, so Janet, would you like to um, introduce yourself? You're the next person that's on video. <laughs> Ani bojo. My name's um, Janet Root. Janet Kiwakum Root. I'm from Saugeen. I live here with my husband Ron, and um, I, I know Lori. And I was keen to hear what the presentation was all about. So um, just want to say, regrets for being um, part of this group, and that's all for now. <laughs> Miigwech. Mm -hmm. uh, Teres, would you like to go next? I'll ask you to unmute. If people don't feel comfortable um, sharing, it's okay. We can um, go. And then if you want to be able to talk later, just put your hand up and yep. I can let Lori know. Yep. Um, so we'll move on to Mary. Hi, I come from Osaka Beach and I'm here to learn. I've only recently found out that I do have major, major heritage and feel a very strong draw to have a better understanding and knowledge of uh, history, of my history that is lost because most of my parents are, are passed away. So I'm really interested in learning all that I can learn. Okay. All right, miigwech. Miigwech. Um, Donna? Hi, I'm uh, Donna, actually, and I live in the Saugeen Peninsula in Lion's Head. Uh, I, uh, I'm here to learn. Um, I've been trying to learn uh, since I realized that we didn't learn anything in history in school, uh, actual history. I've been really trying to make an effort to learn history and, uh, and current issues as well that have, have been ongoing for generations and generations. Um, I'd like to be an ally. I have a lot of friends at uh, Nawash. Um, I, I, I know a certain Heather, um, who Lori, you may know. Um, so yes, uh, I'd like to say that anyone who shares their stories of uh, generational trauma, what happened in the uh, in the residential schools? I think it takes extreme courage for people to speak up, and I'm so grateful and have so much respect um, for people that are sharing their very, very, very personal stories. So thank you. Mm. Miigwech. Yeah. Miigwech, Dona. Sorry for mispronouncing your name there. Okay. <laughs> Um, Mike or Mick, um, if you'd like to go next. Sorry, I guess I didn't put my full name. Um, I'm Michaela. Um, I'm Vietnamese and Métis. I'm based in Toronto. I was just part of a earlier sharing circle and they shared the link to this. So I didn't really know anything about it, but I'm kind of just hopping on. Um, really interested in learning and uh, I've done some kind of solo artwork regarding intergenerational trauma and I'm exploring more of that. So uh, very interested in the topics today and of sharing and experiencing more of that uh, with everybody. Thanks. Miigwech. Mm. Miigwech. And I'll ask Robin if Robin would like to be introduced. Hi, I'm Robin. I've lived in the area for most of my life in Port Elgin. I spent quite a few years on the reserve with several of my friends, and I am just here to support and learn how to support better. Okay. Miigwech. Miigwech, Robin. Um, Therese, I don't know if I'm going to come back to you in case you'd like to be able to say something if you want to 
unmute and I'll just put that request in and get again in case. And then we also had um, Matt just join and Matt, we were just doing a brief round of introductions with everyone in the circle. Uh, so I'm, if you would like to be able to say hi to everyone briefly, um, you're welcome to do so. I'll ask you to unmute. Matt was just coming in though. So um, I know sometimes it takes a minute um, to get the, the everything going. So we can always come back again. <laughs> So I believe that's everyone. Is there, if there's anyone else that hasn't had a chance to introduce themselves, please uh, put up your hand um, and, and I, can, um, I can let you make sure that you're un unmuted. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so what, we'll just continue on. <clears throat> so when we look historically um, at what has happened to our nations, Residential schools were not the first. We've had quite the long history of, of um, institutional um, government, foreign um, types of um, policy, I guess, that has been brought to us. Right from, you know, when we talk about the treaties, uh, we go right back to um, Royal Proclamation and further back even to the Doctrine of Discovery. So there's a lot of history. And looking at how our history has, has impacted us, um, and you're right, somebody had mentioned that these are not the things that were learned in school. I know when I was in school, I definitely didn't learn these things there. Um, so it is a learning and I'm glad that people are, are starting to want to understand and you know, hear from our side of what history has been for us and where, where it has led us and where we're at with that today. So, um, when you go back to the doctrine of discovery, basically that was the point of contact. Um, prior to that, we had uh, our own system. We had our own governance. We had our own ways of maintaining our health and well being. And, and a lot of that had to deal with how we moved around in our territory. What you see today, the reserve system where we're at. Um, is not what it was. So when you hear on the news or you read um, somewhere about the traditional territory, so we talk about, say, the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation territory, that ter territory is actually a lot larger than what you would see as being the Saugeen Reserve or Saugeen First Nation and Nia Ming or Cape Coker. <clears throat> so originally, and our territories didn't have those lines on the maps of, as we've had to uh, create for the court system today. Um, we had agreements with other nations. We had our own government system. Uh, we didn't call it a government system, though. That's, that's a new thing. So for example, looking at our health and wellness, we see today that there are a lot of people that are, have developed diabetes and it's generational. It comes down in the family. And if your grandparents and parents had it, chances are you're gonna have it and your kids are gonna have it. So that's one of the multi-generational issues. But when we look at um, how, we incorporated our physical activity, our emotional balance, our psychological balance, our spiritual balance, and our connection to the land. So when we're looking at the cultural and the historical 
um, impacts of contact and having a foreign society come in and affect where we lived, where our homelands were. Um, so you start looking at the treaties. We had two main treaties, which kept pushing us further and further north until we ended up on these small pieces of land. Whereas we moved, we moved with the seasons, we moved with where the food was. Um, we were hunters, we were gatherers. So we were always physically active and we ate the gifts that were provided by mother earth. We didn't have the processed foods as we have today. So that really has impacted us physically, but also the emotional and psychological effects of not having that connection to the land as we used to have. Um, and then even further today with um, what's happening with say substance abuses and, and, and um, the missing and murdered, um, that puts a lot of fear into people. So, you know, children are, are very closely watched because, you know, there's always that fear and the women, you know, what happens if? So, you know, that's, that's an emotion, that's, a, that's a, a real fear that people internalize, which can cause sickness. Um, we have had people from our community that have gone missing, that have been, you know, they're, they're found, um, murdered. And, oh, I see somebody coming to the door. One second. Excuse me for a second. <laughs> <laughs> um Lori oh there's Lori back okay <laughs> uh, I just had something delivered so that was nice yeah so when we look at all of those things whether it's the cultural whether it's the historical and how it's affected us multi-generationally we have to look at all of those things because it's like it's just been adding and adding and adding to all of those burdens and heavinesses that we that we carry and because of those inabilities um, to be able to um, it's basically we've had the power taken away from an outside force where the 60 scoop um, somebody mentioned uh, um, 60 scoop and how their their family and themselves have been impacted with that that's another thing you know, we've had 60 scoop where outside sources said that you're not looking after your children properly. So we're gonna remove them. Or there were impacts within the family because of residential school and day school and all those things that those children in those institutes were conditioned and forcefully made to learn, which totally um, was opposite of what we understood to be our family and our community. Because we look at we look at our community as a family. We're we're all very, you know, we're we're very close knit. We know everybody. So when something does happen in the community, it affects everybody. Whereas, say if you're in a city and there's you know thousands of people in a city, you don't know everybody. You only know those ones that maybe you have acquaintances at work. Um, maybe you've developed some close friendships and that's your circle and your family, that's your circle. But in uh, Anishinaabe community or native community, everybody knows everybody. So it, it always has this rippling effect. And, you know, looking at that cultural component of being removed from the land, like that's, that's a huge part of, of who we are and our responsibility to caring for the land, you know, so we, you know, we've been moved and, and now we have, you know, a DGR that we have to, you know, we're being asked, what do we do? Like, 
well, we don't want to hear, you know, so there's been all kinds of different discussions like that, but it actually triggers those responses in the body, which is the trauma of, of, of being affected by, you know, being, re, being moved into a smaller area of our territory and not being able to have the power to say no. And we still have that today because we're still under the Indian Act. You know, there's, there's things that <clears throat> we would like to do, but sometimes they still have to ask permission from the minister in order for us to do things. So I think these are, these are um, things that people don't really understand that we are still under a power that affects how we live. You hear about the water, you know, in, in other areas. Um, we have a water system here in the community, but we're still tied into our neighboring community. And, you know, even at that time, whenever we have um, developments outside of our reserve border, even though it's still in our traditional territory, and we try to, you know, raise concerns to say, okay, you know, we don't necessarily agree um, that this is happening. Uh, we need to have some conversation about this. How can we do this in a way that's um, environmentally um, safe? Because um, we want to ensure that our community is safe and we want to make sure that users are safe or maybe we're not even consulted. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's very stressful and it gets, it gets those feelings going that, you know what, we're here, we need to have those conversations, but it goes all the way back to when the treaties came in about being able to take that responsibility that we've been given as Anishinaabe people to have that care, we're the caregivers for the land, but we're, that power has been taken away from us. So it's, you know, it's, it's really hard to be able to balance. But now with the truth and reconciliation, you know, we're, we're seeing, starting to see where um, neighbors and organizations are starting to reach out and they're asking, what can we do? How can we do things better? And that's a, that is, a, those are conversations that need to be had. Last year, when the 215 in Kamloops happened, when they, they discovered, I'm going to say discovered, um, the unmarked graves, that was something Indigenous people across the land knew. They knew they were there. They knew that they were probably at every residential school, but nobody listened. Nobody wanted to hear. So I'm thinking back now to those residential school survivors when the claim process, the compensation claim process um, was being done. I'm wondering if maybe some of those stories were discounted and said, you know, and they were told, we don't believe you and how that affected those people. Like some, some of them probably said, we know that there are graves there. So were they believed? It took what happened last year to discover the unmarked graves for people to listen. And we had received an outpouring here in our community of, of people wanting to know how they could help and you know how can we what can we do and you know in the schools as well how can we teach our children you know but at the same time we asked at that time just to give us give us some some space only because we were being affected as well you know there were there were people triggering within our community so we had to focus within our community to see, okay, what do we need to do? How can we, how can we move through this and support our own survivors? And really everybody pretty well is a descendant 
of a survivor of, of anybody that went to those residential schools because I'm, I'm maintaining a list right now and that's part of the work that I'm doing in the advocacy program is maintaining a list of people, prior students that had attended residential schools. And, and there's a number, there's a, there's a large number, far more than we actually even knew a few years ago. So the numbers are growing and the number of schools that were attended are growing. Um, schools for those residential schools go to Saskatchewan, they go to Manitoba. We had uh, a family that attended boarding school in, um, in the States and Michigan side. We've had the Spanish girls and boys schools. We've got the two and six nations, Mount Elgin and Mushhole. We've got one, you know, some that attended Kenora, um, some that attended Shingwalk and Sault Ste. Marie. So that list is growing. And we still need to continue within our community to have those conversations, but more now, yes, we need to know what happened. We need to honor those ones who attended, but what are we gonna do now to move forward from that? So then now we have the day schools. So we got the day schools, we had three in the community. And I'd say, again, every family had somebody that attended the day schools. So those day schools were basically residential schools, but they were in the communities or beside the communities and the kids went home after school but the same type of abuses happened within those schools. Can you imagine within our own community, not being able to speak our own language in a school, in a structure that sits within our own community. So that, that's what happened um, again. And then 60 scoop, all of these things were all going on at the same time. We've got 60 scoop, we've got, um, training schools there were actually training schools and these at these schools these were not only native children that attended these schools right now there is a class action lawsuit um, where they're I believe they're still in discovery stage so I'm keeping contact with the law firm to see when it might go into claim process but these were school or not schools training yeah training schools that children were sent to and youth were sent to if they were found to have behavioral issues. Um, in our cases here at day school, say the kids were being truant. Well, they were being truant because they didn't wanna to go to school because they were being beaten or whatever was happening to them in the day school. So they chose to not go. And sometimes they were just picked up on the side of the road by the police because the teachers in the school, day school would notify the police and to say that, you know, these kids aren't, aren't here, they're supposed to be here. So then, you know, I've heard stories where the kids were picked up by the police on the side of the road, maybe they were walking home and gone. Some of them never returned. So these are all things. And then further going back, of course, there was the military. Um, when our, our people, our men volunteered to join um, the army or, you know, whatever the armed forces were that they chose to go to, which left the women here vulnerable with the children. So there's that, and there, there's all kinds of, of different parts of history where, where we have had some effect. Um, we had a gathering a few weeks ago um, because it's been a couple of weeks ago was a year from the findings in Kamloops. So we wanted to come together <clears throat> and look at, to honor those, those families, to honor those, those children that never went home, but also to sit and start thinking about what do we do from here? What do we need to do to start moving forward and to start that healing process? And so, you know, we had, we had, we had a fair number come out. But that's, I think, where we need to go now. Um, yes, the history still needs to be taught from our perspective. And maybe that's more so, you know, on, on the outside. And I'm just saying the outside. Please don't take any offense to that. Um, 
but to understand that there was far more to history than what we were taught in school. Even when I went to school, um, there, there wasn't very much. And if there was, it was always negative about who we were. So it's that understanding. And then we can start building that, that allyship and, and how do we work together as human beings. And historical, cultural, multi-generational trauma not only is about indigenous people, there's many, many atrocities and genocides that have happened around the world. Like if you look at, look what's happening in the Ukraine today, look at how families and women and elders and children are, are being killed over there based on you know, another, another belief. Um, so, you know, people being brought to this land across the ocean, historically, you know, some, some were brought over as, as slaves, some were brought over as prisoners. Um, Australia, you know, initially that was a land where they, it was a prison where they, they removed people and placed them on an island to not have to, to have them part of regular society. So when we look at all of those things, we really need to start looking at our own personal history and where we're at today. And that's where, when I mentioned, when I first started um, this conversation was, it's been over 25 years that I've been on my own personal healing journey. Initially, it was finding out, well, who am I? Who, who is this person? And then, you know, as I moved through an understanding in my way um, was to search out what is my culture? What are the traditions of our people? And, and starting to get involved, you know, with understanding um, our connection to the land and how does that affect us in a positive way in when we do connect and how did it affect us negatively when we were removed from portions of, of our historically what our, our, our land base was. And then learning more and moving through the ways that I needed to in order to start to release those traumas and those um, feelings and those angers and whatever those other emotions and triggers and all those things that might be that I kept inside my own body. And it's when we don't look at how can we start to work on those? How do we start to release those, that energy that we're holding inside? We can get sick if we don't release that. So that's where I am today. So today in my own personal journey, it was to learn about how do I become well again? Because I have children and I now have grandchildren. And I want to make sure that this cycle, cycles of multi-generational traumas do not continue to travel down forward into my descendants. Because if that doesn't heal, the world is going to continue um, to experience what we're what we're seeing is happening today. So at this point, um, I would just like to open it up to anybody that would do like to to do any sharing. And Victoria, I guess I just need to check how how long are we online um, with this conversation. So we were, uh, we had like a, a schedule from going from 7.30 to 8.30, mm -hmm. but that's not a hard, um, hard end. So okay. it, it's up to you um, at that point. I can let you know when it's 7.30 if you want. Or and 8.30. Then, yeah. Or 8.30, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <30. laughs> <laughs> and you can, so, you can choose what to do. <laughs> okay. All right. So this conversation, it, it's going to take far more than an hour so but what I just wanted to do was was just to bring it forward 
And it's really important um, that we start having these conversations. I was talking with an elder this morning and, and that's what she reiterated was, you know, the more we hang on to stuff, um, the more sicker we're going to become. We have to be able to let those things go. We have to be able to, um, to forgive because we have to start moving forward. We can't, if we can't do that, then we're continually stuck where we are. And those multi-generational issues are going to continue to pass down. So, but we all have to make that individual choice. You know, it's, we can't magically snap our fingers and, and heal the whole community. We have to make that choice individually. What are we going to do? I chose to be, I wanted to become healthy. I wanted to become well. And as I'm learning and I continue to learn and I continue to heal, but now I'm, I'm, I'm starting to be able to help others to move through that as well. So again, that, that's my journey. So yeah, so let's open it up to conversation now. It says 820, but Victoria said we might have a little bit of leeway there. We'll just kind of go with that. Um, there will be more um, conversations within the community. And if anybody outside Saugeen wants to have those conversations, please don't hesitate to contact me. I can come to you, okay? But for now, let's just have a, an open conversation. Let's just kind of see um, where everybody is at. And if there's any, anything you'd like to share with, with how you're feeling or what your thoughts are, let's, let's have that conversation now. Uh, Dona would like to be able to share something. So um, Lori, um, with respect to the Indian Act, now, uh -huh. is there, I'm really trying to understand that and I read it and I read it. Now, there is, there are some benefits to it, uh -huh. is, but so if we, if the Indian Act was to be abolished and, um, and, and you could get back to self-governing and, and, and doing things the way they used to be done, et cetera. What are the disadvantages of removing the Indian Act? Because the Indian Act allows for some funding to First Nations, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So is, but they're very controlled, like they control all of the First Nations money, don't they? Yeah. yeah. Right, so the land trust and everything is held by the government. Yes. So that is wrong. Like that's your money. Yeah. Um, so what are the disadvantages, I guess, of of abolishing the Indian Act? Okay. If if that if if that is outside of this particular Zoom meeting, then I I apologize and um, it doesn't need to be answered. Well, it's all part and parcel. Um, but yeah, I just want to make sure that anything that I'm expressing is my opinion. Yes. Okay. So Understood. this is my own personal opinion. Um, the Indian Act uh, was originally created to control the Indian. Right. Um, but right now, um, and, and it created dependency. Yes. So... You know, when, when it's, it is frustrating, like you mentioned that, you know, these, the fundings and whatnot, um, there it's our money, you know, we should be able to access that, but you know, at the same time, um, because we didn't have the opportunities to be able to do that. And, you know, even, even up to recent years, um, I'll say back, well, we'll go back to about the 60s. If any of our people wanted to go to school and further their education, such as university and things like that, um, they had to enfranchise, which meant they basically were no longer a member or Indian. They lost their status. They lost their status. And that was because they wanted to go and go to, go to school, right? right? 
So, you know, it all, it had all these little rules in there that, you know, this, this is what we're gonna do. This is what we're gonna, they called it protection, but it wasn't protection. It was in order to have control over, over what we were doing, over what we had, how, and, and it, it, it's so broad, the Indian Act, because it covers the land, it covers, you know, health, it covers everything. So um, part of it would be, we have to ensure that within ourselves, we have an economic system in place that's sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something I believe that we'll have to work towards um, because if, and people, when they hear that we receive funding and you know, there, there's always that stigma out there that you just get free money, you get free right. money. Look at what we had to do to negotiate that we were receiving some kind of revenue coming in for the benefit of our people. So when you look at the treaties, um, some of you know those those treaties said we want to make sure that if this is what this agreement is going to be, we want to ensure housing for our people. We want to ensure health. We want to ensure education. You know, so so those things. So it's it's not free money that we're getting. You know, we had to negotiate all those things, but also the some of the interpretations of those treaties were not what our original intent was. Our intent was sharing, not giving up. Right, right, yes. So that's where we started to lose our land base. Right. So if you look at the 1836 treaty, um, and then where the the next line goes to the 1854 treaty, the 1854 treaty was supposed to protect us. It was supposed to protect from any encroachment, but then they came back and they said, oh, we're sorry, um, we can't do that. We can't protect you anymore from any encroachment. So mm -hmm. then, then more happened. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is a direct, it's a cultural trauma. It's, uh, it's a historical trauma, you know, the, the, and those things contain so many there's so many aspects to how it's affected our lives today. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I have no idea how you can overcome oppression and anger. I, I just, I don't know. Yeah, so. but part of it is also is, is because that's how we've been conditioned to live. Mm -hmm. We also have started to do it internally, so. Right when we say we have to look at ourselves and we have to heal first within, mm -hmm. that's what we have to do first. Right, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've got a hand up. Sorry, um, CC, I forget what your first name was because it's not on the list. So if you want to go ahead and unmute. Hi, it's it's Shante. Hi. Oh, <laughs> Not any better when I say what it is either. Is it? Um, so just a preamble. I'm getting over pneumonia. Oh. It doesn't matter. It won't stop me. But I definitely said a lot manlier than. Um, I'm gonna take my aggressive new voice and use it. Um, I was thinking about what you said there, Lori, and and where I am at. Um trying to intertwine my traumas, which were many, um, um, both inherited and then lived, right? Um, mm -hmm. And what do I do with that now? Because as a, like, you can see, I look a little different. So I'm half Jewish, so I'm Jujibwe. So I come from a long line of people who are oppressed and, 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 um, Thank you, Sam. Um, I have been tried to be murdered on all sides of my family historically for all the generations. Uh -huh. So there's a lot of power in me uh, because I lived uh, to, to tell about it. And I do think when I look back and I study what happened to my birth family and what happened to me, the thing you said about is control uh -huh. having what I also inherited was that instinct that I know something is mine 
uh, there's something about my own path that's mine. You always kind of know that, but the rest of the world is trying to kill that and take that from you. And more specifically being First Nations, being female, being oh. Jewish, being any of those things. And then you feel crazy about your own inner voice and something you already know about yourself, what God or creator gave to you. And so sometimes those roles, when you're trying to break that control, when you become aware of all the different ways you're being controlled and you decide you're going to be what the creator made you to be, and you're going to walk that path, which is really big. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm finding there isn't space for you and it's you're creating a new path because I don't fit. Like I was trying to explain, for example, about my feelings about surviving the 60s scoop. If you keep telling me, I fear going back to being uh, the traditional way, I'm afraid. I have watched my generations get murdered for being traditional First Nations women. I, I have seen even my sister who's younger than me get murdered because she looks and is First Nations we are thinking we keep projecting our own story, even ourselves, onto other people. Mm -hmm. And we don't give this space. There's all these rules. There's white rules. There's red rules. There's the new wave rules where some people don't fit. So I've called myself hybrid because I'm aware of where I'm supposed to be going. I don't know where it is. I can't see it anymore because of how many times they've taken us out. They've taken things from us. It's a mystery, it's like a forest and I can't see the path because if I go back traditional, you're going to try to kill me as proof. If I act white and I could get away with it, I hear everybody who's so racist and terrible and all the comments and all, and I can never abide by this either. So I'm hybrid because I keep dipping in and out of the different worlds, but I can also see we're missing a healing path somewhere in between for people who didn't grow up traditional, didn't grow up white. We grew up rejected. And so we don't fit. And that's where I'm looking for like little pieces to how to help other people like me feel welcome because I think the only way we're going to, um, get anywhere is for allow us to tell our stories right so the the basis of every individual human on earth regardless of the background is we all have spirit so and that's a lot of times where there was the spiritual abuse as well, where we were told that what we do, what we, you know, our belief systems were the foundation of, of who we were, um, those were dismissed as well. But that's what we need to get back to. And like you said, where there, there's so many um, uh, backgrounds now, but let's get back to being that spirit and reconnecting. I'm not gonna say reconnecting because it never disconnected. That spirit is always the foundation of who we are as a human being. Everybody has spirit, regardless of if they believe or not, everybody has spirit. That's what brings life. That's the life force. So to me, that's, that's the focus is who are you as that spirit? And for me, um, part of my, my journey was, you know, doing some of those, those, cultural, um, those cultural ways, those traditional ways of fasting, um, going to ceremony, um, going to sweat lodge. I, I still do sweat lodge today. Um, I'm a pipe carrier. But that was all, when somebody says, I wanna find out who am I? What's my identity? The identity that, you're looking for is the spirit. So regardless of the ancestry, once you start to heal 
that spiritual part of you, those uh, questions, um, you know, the hardships with, with dealing with all of the ancestral traumas that have happened, um, you'll start to find those answers and start to be able to um, feel whole. It's, it's moving to being able to be that whole person again, which is the you know, physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual. When we look at that medicine wheel, that's what we're striving for. So, you know, we got, you know, when we talk about, you know, I have this ancestry, I have this one, and I have this one. And yes, you know, like I'd mentioned earlier, the whole world has had some form of genocide through history. But if we can focus on that spiritual being of who we are and start to be able to heal those traumas that our physical body has started to pick up and then learn to be able to release them, then we can start to understand who that spiritual being is of who we are. And then we can start to move forward and be able to be that presence that will start to positively affect those around you, which will include your family. It, it could include, include all those relationships um, that, that a person had developed. So, you know, looking at uh, what you had just, um, the concerns you had raised about, you know, how, because that carries a lot of burden with it. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of emotional, emotional turmoil, you know, and, and how do I do this and how do I do that? But when we can focus, let's do a focus on that spiritual being of who each and every person is and start to look at what's, what does that spirit need and how does that spirit communicate with the physical being of who we are and that emotional being and that psychological being and how do we start to release those, uh, those impacts, those traumas, those energies that we've picked up that we just, we don't know how to let go of. So that's where the work is. I think there's a little bit more than that, if you don't mind me saying. There's stuff that we can do as a person. I've been really deep rooted in, 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 you know, self-responsibility and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I just want to give you a couple examples of maybe what I'm talking about, what makes it difficult for people like me. And I think there's a lot of people like me, which is why I'm putting it forth. Mm -hmm. If you didn't grow up in your roots, yes. which a lot of us haven't, let's say like I was in a big city. So I lived in the North. And when I actively started on the healing journey on the red road as they said mm -hmm. I trusted the elders and the people who um were presenting the healing journey to me as a newbie as a person who didn't know anything and and um this person offered healing lodges but then ended up sexually assaulting the females mm -hmm. An elder and the whole community knew about it for decades and no one would speak up because it was an elder and I wanted to speak up because I don't have that same fear and nobody would stand with me because mm -hmm. it was an elder and then I moved 500 miles away coming into a new community where they're also now struggling with the only person who was running their healing lodges is a pedophile a convicted pedophile so we see it everywhere yeah so it isn't about now my personal anger. Now it's something else, right? Now it's like, there are so many people like me who know they have to go healing. They don't know what it looks like because we didn't see it. You don't know what you haven't seen. You mm -hmm. know there's something, but you don't know what it looks like. So you end up trusting what the community gathers around and says, and they seem to know better than you. And then you end up in these really more, almost more dangerous because now the people you thought were your people was your connection, was your part of your heart are now part of the trauma story for you personally. And we need to start talking about that because we have, we have to um, not only not be mad about what's happening to us, but find a way 
that's safe for people to walk their path, right? Like, I think we are also responsible for protecting people as we move forward, not just our own anger. Is that fair, would you say, or no? It is. I, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, but unless we start looking at our own self, we can't help those around us because we'll, we're, we're still carrying those things that can trigger us and those hurts. And, and there is that, you know, there's that secondary trauma as well. Like you said, we know what it, we know it's there. We didn't experience, it, but we know there's something there. So, you know, there are those secondary traumas and all those other types of the names that they give them. Um, so when I'm talking about spirit, I'm not talking about any specific belief system. Yes, you do speak the truth when you've talked about there are those, you know, the, there are those healers that have hurt people. And they do exist. Actually, I had a conversation with somebody about that today. Um, so that is real because that healer hasn't healed. They're doing what happened to them. So there's the saying is healer, heal thyself. You can't help people unless you've healed from those situations. So that's what I'm saying. We need to focus on ourselves and look at all of those things that we carry as an individual and connect that with our spiritual being. So, and, and in the healing work that I do, um, that's what I'll do. You know, I'll, we'll, we'll do one-on-one -on -one sessions or we'll do group sessions, but we have to look at all, all of those things. Um, but there's a certain way to do that because you also don't want to re-traumatize people, right? And having to relive those experiences that they had. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a way that um, that's done. But, I, you know, I totally agree with you in the sense of, yeah, this is what's happening. And then that puts people in that position of saying, you know what, I tried that, I'm not going there again. So, you know, really what it's done then is it's shut the door on what could possibly have been a really good thing had it been the right person. But like you have identified that people need to start talking about these things. And that's part of why I, I wanted to bring this topic up was we do need to start talking about these things we can't keep hiding them we can't keep them in the shadows and pretend these things didn't happen because then we're avoiding we're avoiding our own personal healing but it can also be done in a way that keeps that you know yourself say say you say you were coming um for for work healing work it has to be done in that safe way for you. Yeah. Not to make you more, not to harm you more and, you know, cause you to turn away. I, I, I've had that. I've had to, I've had people come to me after they've seen somebody for healing and I've had to clean them up. I've had to do healing from the healing work that they got because it ended up harming them more. So, you know, it, it is, we have to be very careful on, on going to people that, you know, check them out, just like you would a doctor, check out your doc, you always check out, is this, you know, how, how many years has this doctor been practicing, what do, you know, so, you know, always check them out. We say that, but people don't know, right? Like That's right. They, they don't talk about it. Right. Or like where the path that I went on, these people were highly recommended to me and to the other women um, that were in my group too. These were very highly recommended and high spoken of in the community. And then afterwards in the hush hush tones, oh yeah, we knew about this. Um, so I was feeling like there has to, I don't, what I don't know now is what is the safe place because 
for me, and I know I still have healing work to do, when I hear, oh, go see this traditional person, I'm triggered. My memory automatically goes back to being vulnerable with somebody who blatantly um, um, broke that, right? And yeah. for me and a bunch of other very vulnerable, lovely people. Yeah. So now my, my interest is in how could I create a safe space for people like me and, and, and more of people who are even slightly different than me where yeah. it's, it's not triggering and they feel included, right? And, and, and because those rules got broken on both sides, the red side, the white side, and now it's a hybrid. How can we just provide such a safe place? Because those stories need to be told. We have to be allowed now to tell our truth, even if it's not a truth that somebody else shares, because maybe Andrea was nice to you, but Andrea is a jerk to me. They're still both true. Mm -hmm. I don't know an Andrea, so, so there's no Andrea here, but I'm just saying like, yeah, we have to create a place where it's safe to tell the truth. Wouldn't you yep. agree with each other or no? Right. Um, I'm going to suggest um, if you would like for Victoria to give you my personal contact information and we can connect at a later time. And we can we can we can look at this further if 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 you would like to do that. Yes, thank you. Sorry if I monopolized the time. No, no, that's thank fine. You. No, that's okay. But yeah, if if you want my my personal contact information, then um, I'll get Victoria to to send that to you. And we'll we'll look at this further and we'll we'll chat a little bit more. If that's okay with you. Yes, miigwech. Okay. Um, in the chat, I put the email address for the Bagadawan Alliance. I think everybody that's here has it anyway, but it's B-A-G-I-D-A-W-A-A-D at gmail.com. So if anyone uh, wants to connect, um, please just, just send us an email. Both Natasha and I received them. Okay. Yeah. So anybody, um, if you want my, uh, I do see a message in here. Um, my personal contact information, just um, go ahead and, and email uh, bogdawad at gmail.com and then um, they'll be able to send you my personal contact information. And we'll be in touch, and I'll get in touch, okay? Because like I said, this, it's, it's a very, very um, broad topic, but it's very personal as well because it affects everybody. Doesn't matter what your background is. There's there's historical, cultural, multi generational trauma out there. So um, that's a lot of what I, I work with. So if you're interested in um, looking at this further, then yeah, don't hesitate to to make contact. But it's just the understanding that the conversation needs to be had. Um, miigwech, Shante. <laughs> I appreciate you sharing. I remembered your name. I wrote it down this time. <laughs> um, Lori, we've gone a, a little over time. Um, mm -hmm. And I know it's a very heavy conversation. Um, so it's up to you if um, if you'd like to continue or not. Um, I'm, I'm willing to stay if you want. But if not, um, uh, I think, yeah, I, I think just at this time, because I mentioned that before we, we all sign off, um, I just want to make sure everybody's in a good space. Um, if anybody needs to have further conversation, um, maybe go ahead and contact that email address and I can, I can um, make contact with you. So it's just kind of, it, the, you call this a debrief because you get into a difficult conversation or even just hearing those difficult conversations because they can um, you know, bring up those emotions within yourself, even though you, know, you, you may not have wanted to share, but you wanted to be part of and just listen. Um, some of these things that may have um, been discussed may have you know, opened up some emotions. So a debrief is just kind of going around and just 
seeing how everybody is. So I don't know how many people are on right now, Victoria. Uh, there's 14 of us all in total. Okay. If we go through just a real quick check, do we have time for that? Of course. Okay. Okay, so let's go around. And again, I'll leave it to Victoria to unmute and it's up to you if you choose to talk or not. And it's just, it's just more checking in with you. How are you feeling now? How are you feeling right now? Okay, I just wanna make sure when you're going off line that you're not carrying something that has opened up. If it has, please make contact with that um, email address so Victoria and uh, Natasha can send you my personal information. Okay. Um, so let's just do a quick go around and then we'll, everybody can get on with their evening. <laughs> but, but this has been a good conversation and I wanna thank everybody um, um, that shared and, and just signed in to be a part of this because this, this is important. And in order for things to start to make that change, we have to look at those difficult things, but we also need to look at what are we gonna do for ourselves to start um, that healing process and start moving forward, but also looking at that resilience of we're still here, no matter what those ancestries are, we're still here. So, you know, our ancestors, not only, you know, I've seen that saying our ancestors not only passed down trauma, they trauma, they passed down strength and resilience. And so let's, you know, we need to also embrace that part of ourselves as well. Okay. Okay, so I think I'll go in the reverse order this time. So okay. um, I'll give an opportunity for Therese, if you'd like to be able to say anything. Um, uh, please unmute yourself. And I know earlier you um, didn't. So um, Tammy. I'd just like to thank you for for what's been said and and um, I have been doing a lot of personal healing. I've been working with uh, a healer through the Indigenous Network doing phone consultations and it's helped a lot. Miigwech. Okay. Miigwech. Miigwech, Tammy. Um, Robin? Uh, thank you, Lori and Victoria, for putting this on. I definitely am glad to have been able to be here and listen and learn. Thank you for providing that education and helping people to be able to open up and learn from their traumas. Um, we all come from a space where we've had traumas in our life, and I do think that being able to be open and talk about it with people definitely helps in the healing process. Rich. Um, Pat, would you like to be able to share anything? I can certainly just say I'm really sorry because I arrived late and um, I would really like to watch the recording. If I, if you can uh, give us that information, Victoria, that would be appreciated. Uh, for sure. I, okay, otherwise, unfortunately, I don't have much to add because I did miss the, the bulk of the content. Yeah, well, thank you for being here. Um, we will be putting it on the on the Bogotawad Alliance's YouTube channel, so it will be there in the videos, but it's also being live streamed live streamed to Facebook. So if anyone looks back on the Bogotawad Alliance uh, live stream for tonight, you'll be able to find it um, for the first day or two. It'll be easy to find, and then after that, it'll be harder. So if you if you wait too long to watch, it'd be easier to find on the YouTube channel. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, my question. Uh, Janet? Yes, um, 
like to say miigwech to each and every one of you. Um, I know the topic is heavy and it takes a bit of bravery to say what's really, what's really in your hearts and in your minds. So um, just wish everyone well as they continue. We're on this journey on this earth. So yes, we have work to do. Miigwech. 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 Um, Matt, would you like to be able to say anything? Yeah, yeah, I, I'd love to say something personally. I'd like to say thank you for uh, for having me, for letting me be part of this, and uh, and, 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 and and I appreciate what you uh, what you talked about, and then what you what you said, and then and for me, I'm kind of, I'm an outsider for for this situation. I'm I'm a I'm a, I'm a Dutch farmer, you know, and, and this is. I need to immerse myself in the situation in order to understand and, and, and kind of develop myself as a, uh, my, my, my background and my understanding and, and my opinions, right? Because uh, growing up, um, you know, there, there was always bias towards the in, in indigenous people, right? And that's what I grew up in, right? So now it's just for me moving forward and, and, and I've been through, uh, you know, not, not, not associated trauma like that, but I have been through trauma before and, and I do feel that, that I've uh, forgiveness is is the key to moving on. So, uh, so yeah. From uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you much. Thanks, Matt. Um, Mary, I just want to thank you for being able to be here. Uh, it's been uh, very interesting and thought provoking. It's certainly brought forward some ideas of of trauma for myself that I know I will be doing some in. Uh, deep diving into over the next few weeks, and I look forward to being here again another time. Thank you. Miigwech. 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 Um, uh, Dona? Hey, hi. Um, uh, thanks. Thanks again, Lori, for everything, and to Victoria and Natasha for organizing. Um, I have a lot to think about. Um, and I think that uh, uh, if we connect spirits, we're stronger together and we can share some of the burdens, but um, we just really need to work at connecting with each other too, mm -hmm. to try to try to even things out. So thank you very much. My gosh. My gosh. Um, Catherine? Hi, uh, just a really deep and heartfelt thank you, Lori, for the healing work you've done for yourself and for your community. It's, I'm, I'm speechless, actually, to be honest. Um, I came tonight um, as part of my, of my own spirit work. Um, and I think that this will be sort of a continuous lifelong journey. Mm -hmm. And I think as a settler, I think it's you know critically important that we 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 listen to the stories and we can bear witness for those stories within our own people and our own network. So thank you very much for the privilege of being allowed to come tonight and also to Victoria and Natasha for arranging it. Great. Mm -hmm. Miigwech. Um, Shantae? I've said enough. <laughs> so miigwech, everybody. It's nice to see all of your beautiful faces. And um, I hope to get to know you guys some more. So thank you. Mm, miigwech. Alexa? Yes, thank you very much for putting this on. What felt really important to me is, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a psychotherapist and I became a psychotherapist to heal myself, no question. Um, and I've done a lot of work on myself and I, and I, I feel I, I'm almost sane, almost, <laughs> you know, but I was pretty crazy for a long time. And, um, and I, I remember somewhere this story, and I think it's in the telling of our stories 
and the receiving of those stories. It's the feeling received, like our stories and our pain matters to someone. We need someone to care for our pain. Mm -hmm. And I, I just remember the story and I have no idea where I heard this, you know, but when we talk about land, there are places in Owen Sound that were um, unseated that, you know, that are, are starting to be gardened now. But, you know, this whole area belonged to you. And, and when I first came here, I was at Inglis Falls and I had this vision that there were, that there were people fishing at the bottom of the falls. And I saw the spears and I saw the people and it was like a, it was like a dream, but it, it, it basically was made what made me decide to come here. And I felt very privileged to be able to work at GNB House with, um, with the native community. This was a long time ago when I worked there. Um, but the, the story that stands out for me was one of the land that was taken, you know, you kept being pushed further and further from land that could be productive and could sustain you. Mm -hmm. And I remember the hearing the story about the women would bring the children into town because there was no food up at Cape because there were rocks. And Cape to me is the most beautiful spiritual place. I drive on, you know, I drive there and I just feel rejuvenated. There's something that happens to me when I go there. But it's not the kind of land that could sustain you. And you were being, you know, you were being squished and squished and squished. So I, I think when I think of the, the story that, you know, what you were saying, Laurie, about the land and the importance of the land and being able to move around as needed for life. Mm -hmm. the, you know, I, I just, I'm just so sorry for the awful ways that you've been treated. Miigwech. Mm. Miigwech. Um, Natasha? Uh, just me, Gretch Floyd. Um, it was wonderful for you, for you to uh, um, lead us through this conversation. It is not easy. Um, and uh, it's an important conversation to have. And uh, thank you again. Just thank you. And uh, giving me lots to think about and uh, be thankful for. And uh, I really appreciate your time and knowledge and and gentleness and regret. Uh, uh, regret. Um, did I miss anyone? Uh, is there anyone else that would like to I'll speak that I didn't catch? <laughs> I think we went through the list. Um, Miigwech, Lori, um, as always, you are um, a rock of strength. Um, and I appreciate every moment I ever get with you. Um, <laughs> so you're, um, you're inspirational to a lot of people. So we're really um, honored that you could be here tonight. So miigwech. Well, miigwech to you all. And just take care of yourselves, love yourselves, and just be kind to yourselves. Miigwech. Bamapi. Mm -hmm. Bamapi.